Good afternoon and welcome to our August Dementia Dialogue. My name is Heather Mulder and I'm going to be your moderator for today's session. In 2016, we're taking an in-depth look at Alzheimer's disease, and August finds us looking more closely at moderate Alzheimer's disease and specifically discussing facilitating care needs. A bit of housekeeping before we begin this afternoon. You have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation, and we will collect these and address them during the question and answer session at the end of today's presentation. For any of you who are listening um, exclusively on the phone, we are unable to take live questions from you. However, we've provided contact information at the end of the presentation that you can use if you need further clarification or have additional concerns. Our session today is being recorded and will be posted on our website within 48 hours of today's broadcast. With that being said, it is my pleasure today to introduce to you Jerry Hall. Um, Jerry Hall is a board-certified clinical nursing specialist who has specialized in the care of people affected by dementia since 1980. Dr. Hall works for Banner Alzheimer's Institute as an advanced practice nurse, helping caregivers to effectively manage challenging behaviors and other daily living challenges encountered in the face of dementia. Dr. Hall's graduate work was completed at the University of Iowa, where she taught and became a full professor. Her research and practice is focused on prevention and management of secondary behaviors and helping families to manage. She is widely published and has presented her model, Progressively Lowered Stress Threshold, across the United States, Australia, Ireland, and South Korea. With that being said, please welcome our presenter today, Dr. Jerry Hall. Thank you. It's very nice to be here. Um, one of the things that we are concerned about with moderate dementia is that the care becomes more and more complicated. The person loses the ability to plan, initiate, and carry through to a goal things that are basic such as grooming, bathing, and dressing, um, and at the same time has behavioral symptoms and changes such as uh, significant losses of, vi of vision, uh, and ability to recognize. Um, therefore, uh, what should have been a simple task, such as bathing, can become very complicated. The following uh, presentation, we're going to take some of the care issues and discuss why they're a problem and also give you some tips for management. The need for structure is very important. With the person with dementia, they're less able to adapt to changes in the environment. And so automatically, they'll begin to go on to sort of an automatic pilot, where they do the things in the same order each day. When changes are introduced, the person has to think about what they can do and has difficulty doing it. This produces anxiety, often agitation, uh, and tearfulness or refusing behavior. Uh, people with dementia at this point will function best in a quiet, structured environment. A structured environment means that the person's wor uh, world is consistent yet flexible. Now, we don't have to do the same thing in the same order every day, but it helps. But if the patient wants to do something different, then we can be flexible enough to accommodate that also. The other thing is that as a care partner, your role shifts from that of being a consultant to being somebody who actually assists, almost like a prosthesis would if you had lost a leg, you lost part of your memory, um, and those brain functions, and therefore we need to assist with that. One of the first things that's huge that we talk about is sleeplessness and fatigue. It occurs for any number of reasons. Uh, but primarily, the person becomes overtired uh, just trying to concentrate on what's going on during the day, figure out what comes next, figure out what just happened, and live in the environment. It's almost as if you were taking final exams over and over and over again every day and trying to study on it. When you have somebody who's overtired, 
what we tend to see is sleeplessness, most common, where they're, they go to bed at 7 o'clock in, uh, in the evening, and they're, at midnight they get up and they're ready to start another day uh, and spend a good deal of time up at night. Um, the other thing is if they don't get enough rest during the day, we see late day confusion. We used to call that sundowning syndrome, but we don't really anymore because our research has shown pretty clearly that it's fatigue and not light levels that cause problems with agitation and late day confusion. Um, what we do is, for this is really quite simple. Um, we provide rest periods two times a day in early moderate dementia. And early moderate dementia can be defined as when the patient is beginning to have difficulty with bathing and grooming. We begin with two rest periods, one in mid to late morning that lasts about 30 minutes, and another one uh, after lunch for 60 to 120 minutes, depending on the patient's disease. If the patient is still going to bed very early, such as 6 or 7 or 8 at night, um, then you might want to introduce another brief rest period uh, before the person uh, has supper. Um, we don't want to give the rest periods in bed if we can help it at all. So it could be a quiet room in a recliner, um, listening to soft music, but it's very important you do not want the television on because the injured brain or the, the brain that has the illness will tend to pick up what's on TV and absorb it even though you don't think they're watching. So if they're going to bed early, we want a short rest period before dinner. After dinner, we want a quiet activity such as reading, slow dancing, listening to soft music, and end it with a sweet treat like ice cream. This helps them to have a, a full night's sleep. Um, it also gives them a little bit of melatonin. Um, not melatonin, but it, it helps to give them some, some milk and dairy, uh, and it helps to maintain their weight. Um, and then you, what you want to do is start that, let's say they're going to bed at 7, so you want to keep them up for set to 7.15 the next week, and then a week after that, take them up to 7.30, so that you're moving it back with the activity and have holding the treats later. Wandering and roaming, about 60% of people in the home wander. It decreases to about 23% in long-term care. However, uh, most wandering episodes are not reported because families sort of don't think about it. Um, wandering can occur with either with walking, but it can also occur on bicycles and in automobiles and golf carts. Um, if the person is not found within 24 hours, there's about a 50% risk that they won't survive the wandering episode. Um, people wander for any number of reasons. Uh, one of the most common is they feel like they have to fulfill a responsibility, such as I have to pick up the children from school, I need to go to work, that sort of thing. It can be due to delusions or fear of harm based on psychosis. And the most common cause of that is television where the patient sees something on television or hears it over and over and over again, fears that something terrible is happening, such as the neighbors might have crack cocaine in their house when they don't. Um, but the patient becomes very frightened. So we really watch what goes on on television and don't turn on things that would produce delusions, such as continuous news feeds, um, uh, talk shows that are aggressive, uh, murder mysteries, etc. Um, very often they can be looking for a de deceased relative or they can be angry with um, their care partner and want to go driving or, or just get out of the house. When wandering, you first you want to have the person with dementia wear a safe return medic alert bracelet. Uh, and you want it on their dominant hand so they can't get it off. It's difficult to get off anyway. But that helps somebody who's looking at somebody for somebody. They see the bracelet and they know to stop the person. Um, consider GPS devices. There are a whole new group of them out uh, called TAGS. 
Uh, there are ones that can be put on a phone, but that way you can easily locate the person. Um, it can be sewn into clothing or tape, uh, glued into a shoe so that the person doesn't have to carry anything. Um, complete and carry the BAI information card. Make sure that exterior doors and windows are secured. If the person wanders once, they will wander again. It's not a matter of telling them not to do it again. Um, it's something they can't control. Um, attaching a slide bolt to the base of a door can help. Uh, but you don't want to show the person where the slide bolt is. Um, store car keys where the person can't locate them. Uh, in the freezer is very common. If you go to online, you can find uh, things that look like uh, Coke cans and, and other sort of uh, boxes that have been used for sugar and that sort of thing. And you can store them in there so the person can't find them. Find a new hiding place if the person finds them and never announce where the keys are. Um, if the person is missing, you want to stop everything and call 911. In this area in particular, people are, the police and law enforcement are trained to look for people who are wandering. Your job is to stay at home by the phone and give directions. You want to have a picture with the person in the outfit they tend to wear most so that people know who they're looking for and what they should be wearing. Do not call the family first. Uh, it just wastes time. The faster you respond in calling 911, the better chance of finding your person. And then give the first responders a list of suggestions where the person might have gone. It's interesting because medications do not necessarily help with wandering. Um, but they can cause the person to fall or become increasingly confused and more vulnerable. Eating is another challenge. Um, many of our patients prefer sweets. What happens is that as I become more demented, I lose my sense of smell. And that's affected quite early in the disease. Once my sense of smell goes, that greatly affects what I can taste. Uh, all of my taste has to come from my tongue which is um, only in, equipped to sense sweet, sour, bitter, and salty. And so if something's not sweet, it tastes sour, bitter, or salty. And so many of our patients begin to gravitate towards sweet foods. We go ahead and let them eat sweet foods. If it's that or nothing, there's nothing magic about broccoli. You know, it may be good for you, them, you know, the idea of, big, full, balanced meals and all that may have to fall by the wayside during this time. Um, the other thing is that if you're cooking something like meat or broccoli or whatever, you can always take some fresh fruit and cook it up with the, the substance, and that will make it sweeter, and it will still be a little bit healthy. With utensils, you want to gravitate towards finger foods because the person may not be able to manage a fork or spoon as well. Some patients develop difficulty with chewing. Um, what you want to gravitate is to softer foods. Um, patients very often will have difficulty with foods like steak or hard meat. Um, and so you want to make sure that it's well cooked, it's served in gravy, and little by little you're going to gravitate towards the consistency of macaroni and cheese. Um, patients are very often in this stage overwhelmed by uh, portions. And so instead of giving them three large meals, we give these patients a, a sh small meals of high density, high density calories uh, about every hour to two hours. And this examples of high ice cream, cheesecake, peanut butter and jelly, milkshakes, um, any of those can be part of a regular diet. If your person is a diabetic, what you want to do is talk with your primary care physician, not necessarily your endocrinologist, um, because your primary care physician has sort of the big picture, and ask what are the blood sugar levels that you really need to maintain. Because if you've got someone who won't eat anything but sweets, and you're afraid you're poisoning them, that's going to be a real problem for you. Um, 
usually your primary care physician is going to say, you know, we can live with a 250 to 300 blood sugar or what have you, so that you don't have to become the dietary police. Um, with weight loss, we increase the calories of the food that we give the patient and we feed every time we think of it. Feeding in a patient who is losing weight, what, regardless of whether they started at 90 pounds or if they started at 300 pounds, um, the weight loss of more than six pounds in six months is something we have to look at if it's not voluntarily and start giving food that is uh, fattening. Uh, another problem we have with eating is that patients at this point will very often refuse water, fearing loss of control of bladder. Um, it's very important, particularly if a patient is beginning to become incontinent of urine or feces, that they drink a lot um, to clear out the bladder and keep it clean. Uh, also, increased fluid intake will prevent urinary incontinence for a long time. Um, so we encourage regular intake of small amounts very frequently. Um, if the patient doesn't like water, substitute it with juice. Um, serve the fluids in smaller cups. Um, although some patients have had a lot of l uh, luck with um, things that the patients carry around that are cups with straws in them. Um, but preventing urinary tract infections and incontinence is, is a very important goal. And so the fluid intake is um, very important. At this stage, liberal diets need to be encouraged as the goal is for, to promote eating. You know, if we've got somebody who's saying, well, we want you on a low cholesterol, low this, low that diet, um, very often you're going to have a patient that isn't going to eat. With bathing, bathing is one thing that is the most challenging thing that happens. When a patient loses the ability to bathe, it's that they can't sequence the order of the activities to reach that goal. So that they have to turn on the water, they have to know how hot to get it, they have to know where the towels and the washcloth and the soap is, and they have to get the clothes off and get into the bathroom and go through all that. And it's very, very difficult. So many patients refuse to bathe. But they don't say, would you help me bathe? Well, instead, they're saying, I've already bathed. Thank you very much. Or I don't feel like it right now. Um, it's important to understand that there's no medications that are going to, going to help with, bathe, uh, with bathing, uh, particularly if you've got somebody getting in and out of a bathtub. The last thing you want them to do is be on a sedative if you can help it, because you don't want them to fall. Tips for bathing, first you have to have the right mindset. You want to be flexible and creative. You know, the person may have always taken a shower or a bath, but now it's time to do a towel bath in, in the bed or do um, have them sit at a, the sink on a chair and be able to, to be washed down that way. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that the bath is only a step of the process of getting ready for something pleasurable. Um, you know, let's get you bit cleaned up so you can go out for lunch. Let's do this so we can do that. Um, is much better approach than it's time for your bath. Um, second, set the stage. You want the optimum number of baths unless you've got somebody who's either got an open wound or who is incontinent, the optimum number of baths or showers is three times a week. But again, it doesn't have to be the big scrub you head down head to toe. Many patients will develop a fear of water. And so washing at the sink, you, you can do just about as good a job, you know, and have the patient stand for peri care. Um, you can do just about as good a job as you can in the shower. Making sure the bathroom is warm, quiet, and inviting. This is where long-term care centers have had a problem. Very often their shower rooms are cold, they're tile, they're noisy, the tile isn't pretty, um, the towels are kind of horrible. Um, so you want to have fluffy robes and anything you can to make it more pleasurable. Have all the supplies ready ahead of time. 
so that you don't have to stop in the middle of it and have the person wait and you know try and keep them in the tub. Have the person with dementia determine when to bathe. If they've always bathed in the evening, trying to start them in the morning is not going to be a good idea. Um, or offer choices. Do you want to bathe now or in a half an hour? 90% um, of the time a patient will say, I'll wait a half an hour, and then they will do it. Patient has, very often patients have fear of falling in the shower. Uh, shower chairs are readily available in health supply stores. And they're used with a handheld shower head. Um, the patient can sit at the sink to bathe with minor assistance for pericure in their lower back. Um, the, another thing is that many patients fear water on their head. You can avoid showers. You can use no rinse shampoo. And if you go to a beauty supply place, many of them carry, um, they look like broad-billed hats, broad-brimmed hats without um, the center part. And you can use that so that the water does not come down on the patient. Uh, another thing for um, washing hair is to take the patient to a beauty parlor or a barber and get their head scrubbed once a week. Uh, the patient may be shy or modest, and this is particularly in case a patient has um, issues with um, not recognizing their spouse all the time, um, and so there may be this fear of modesty. Uh, sometimes a home health aide can come in and do what a spouse can't do due to this modesty. Uh, we always make sure the patient has a large towel to cover up. And don't be afraid to bathe the patient with their underwear on. Sometimes you have a patient who doesn't want to change their clothes because they don't think of it as dirty. Um, if they bathe with their underwear on, it's easy to get a patient out of cold, wet underwear. Um, Final reminder, first of all, bathing is only a small part of life. It tends, when you have a patient who tends to not want to bathe, it suddenly becomes a focus and you have to fight against that. I've had patients who have not bathed in, I've had several that hadn't bathed in over a year and they had no body odor and they were fine. Nobody developed life-threatening infections or anything like that. Uh, while I'm not saying we should all let our patients go for a year, I think it's important that we don't just focus on it. Um, we don't want to look at the bath as a teachable moment. Very often the caregiver will tell me that they're trying to teach the person to rebathe themselves. Um, once the person has lost the ability to bathe, they may be able to do it periodically, but not on a regular basis. And um, you're better off just helping them. Uh, the bath, bathing is not a battle to die on the beach for. Uh, it's just a bath. Uh, if you need additional information and strategies, there is a site, uh, bathingwithoutabottle.unc.edu slash bathing techniques. That's bathingwithoutabattle.unc.edu forward slash bathing techniques. With dressing, this also becomes a problem because dressing is very complicated. Many of us have closets full of clothing. Each piece that we have gets put on differently uh, in different orders and there are different colors and it can be very confusing for the patient. So what we find is that little by little the patients begin to um, wear the same clothing day after day after day. This is a good thing. Um, Changing clothing, clothing uh, and putting on something that looks and goes on differently can cause anxiety. Um, the person may not be able to select clothing to match the weather or the occasion, so you're going to have to sort of lay things out for them. When the patient begins to wear the same outfit day after day, go to notice what it is, notice the color and how it goes on, and then go to an uh, like a catalog store like Land's End or Orvis and buy several outfits that are exactly the same. Make sure they're washable and that way you can get the patient's clothing off at night and get him into a, or him or her into a clean outfit every single day.
Um, the other thing is that if the patient wanders away, you can always tell the police what the person is wearing, which is very helpful uh, to them. Lay out the clothing on the bed in the order that it goes on, so that uh, you might have the underpants on top and then uh, work your way down to the shoes and socks. Um, and provide options as needed. Would you like to wear uh, blue or yellow today? If they can't, you always say the blue looks good and mark that in your mind that it's time to buy things that look alike. Loss of language ability is one of the basic tenets of dementia. In moderate dementia, the person understands less and less of what's being said. They also have difficulty with word finding, and they may begin to uh, have what we call word salad, where they're injecting other words or uh, sounds into their conversation. Uh, the other thing is if the person spoke another language during childhood, no matter how long it's been since they spoke it, they may go back to speaking it again. Um, Finding a tr an interpreter can work for a little while, but then they tend to become uh, aphasic or without language in their own uh, primary language. Some of the specific strategies, slow down. Give them extra time to process, use simple sentence structures, um, rely less on written prompts as the person probably at this point has very little reading comprehension. Keep in mind that the person with dementia is trying their best at all times. And listen and watch very carefully. I call this listening with your heart. Because a lot of times you sort of know what the person is trying to tell you. Make sure you explore it with them. Um, you know, you want the red shirt or the blue shirt. And, you know, and you get back word salad. Um, you can ask them to point, use gestures. Um, but give them time. And the other thing is when you're trying to um, communicate with somebody with dementia and with language problems, you want to make sure that the television is off, the radio is off, there's no music on, that every, all of the attention is on the task at hand. Activities are the single most important part of dementia care. When I have someone who's simply frail, I know I can get them bathed, dressed, and fed as a nurse, and they'll plan on what to do the rest of the day. Your person with moderate dementia does not know how to fill that day. And so what happens is, number one, they'll tend to sleep all day because they don't know what else to do. Or they'll get depressed. Or they'll get angry and agitated. And so it's very important to find adequate activities. Very important, television is not an adequate activity. Television produces more misperceptions of children in the house, of people doing evil things, that sort of thing. And it doesn't give the person any exercise. It doesn't give them any stimulation. Um, with activities, we can prevent depression while maintaining self-esteem and function. We can prevent other behavioral symptoms. Um, adult day programs, if they are in, you have one in your area, uh, they provide structured activities and socialization developed for the person's level. And this is actually easier than try, you trying to plan the activities, because you're thinking of your spouse who may have been uh, the president of a corporation or an attorney or a physician. and Suddenly, they're in singing songs to an organ player. Um, and that's very distressing to, to, to families. Whereas to daycare staff, it's just the way it is. Um, if there are no day programs in your area, consider hiring a companion several times a week. Take the person walking, play, shoot hoops, do puzzles, art, exercise, uh, to going out for lunch, music, and activities. Uh, this can be the difference between having problem behaviors and having no problem behaviors. Illusions and delusions, we've been I've been talking about this. This is perceptual losses. The part of the brain that's very effective besides the memory center is the one that takes in and assigns meaning to everything we take in from the environment, whether it's speech, taste, touch, or seeing. 
basically the eyes are taking the picture, but the brain isn't developing the film correctly. And so what happens is there are false recognitions, there are fixed false beliefs, um, and these are not traditional hallucinations. This is not traditional psychosis. So turning off the television um, and getting rid of mirror images and closing your drapes or blinds at sundown can do a, a huge amount to just get rid of those illusions. The other thing is, I hate to say it again, please turn off the TV, stick to family-oriented TV, sports, etc., um, and leave the murders to somebody else. Um, when the per your person starts to talk about uh, silent children in the house, murders in the neighborhood, uh, again, before you do anything, I would check with your primary care physician to make sure there's no urinary tract infection or anything like that, and then I would turn off the television. With providing care for in the moderate stage, it becomes increasingly challenging uh, and it can be frustrating for both the person with dementia and the caregiver alike. Uh, we always assume that the person with moderate dementia is doing their best at all times. Um, and they're as frustrated as you are. Uh, but with patients and added learning, caregivers can adapt um, approaches to provide successful care. Questions. Um, and you want to join us next month, September 21st at 12 noon for maintaining connections with moderate Alzheimer's disease. Thank you, Jerry, and thanks for the pitch for next month's Dementia Dialogue as well. Um, we have quite a bit of time left that you can ask your questions to Jerry. Um, please do enter them in the question pane of, the, of your dialogue box on your screen. Um, in the meantime, we did have a few questions come in throughout your talk, Jerry, that I'd like to try to cover with you. Um, the first one references um, when you were talking about sleeping. Someone noticed that you did leave one option out, and that would be to try to give their person sleep medications. Um, could you maybe speak to that a little bit? Uh, sure. I, it's a good question. Um, we have a tendency to want to give medications because, number one, it's, it's a lot easier. Um, I'm a very firm believer in using medications if the person has been up night after night after night. If you're getting, um, if you have somebody who's getting up three nights a week or more, then you as a caregiver really need the rest. But know that the medications that we give will tend to promote fall, promote additional confusion, maybe promoting continence uh, or more confusion and wandering. And so we're a little bit concerned when we use medications. The other thing is that people with dementing illnesses are very um, often highly uh, sensitive to medications. And so we may get either of three things. We may get an overwhelming response so the patient sleeps for three or four days. Or we may get what we call a paradoxical effect, which means that you get exactly the opposite of what you hoped for. Um, and it, it's characterized by something we call akathisia, which means that the person moves spontaneously and continuously, and they can't sit down. They're just, and they're very upset with it. They're wringing their hands and moving. Um, the third thing is that we can get what we call a rebound, where as the medication wears off, the agitation becomes much, much, much worse. And so. We have to use medications very carefully. If we can stop the uh, night wakening and late day confusion by giving somebody two rest periods a day, then that really makes a huge difference. And you've got a patient who's able to converse more, uh, and they're going to be safer, and they're not going to fall. Great, thank you. So in summary, we really want to try to avoid giving additional medications to our person. Um, you, another question, I'm sorry. If you can. You know, yes. if you haven't had a, night, a good night's sleep in two weeks and your person is up, the other thing is you want to check with your primary care physician to make sure there's not a urinary tract infection or a big problem with night wakening 
Uh, most of our patients with Alzheimer's disease are over the age of 50. And most of us over the age of 50 have a, a certain degree of pain. Um, you know, your hip hurts, your back hurts, and pain is always worse at night. And patients with dementia are very sensitive to pain, even if it's mild pain. So very often, instead of a sleeping pill, we'll start with acetaminophen, which is also known as Tylenol, um, 500 milligrams, two tablets before bed, and two tablets in the morning. And sometimes that can knock out the problem as it sort of slowly controls minor pain. Thank you for that clarification. Um, we did have a couple more questions come in that I'd like to try to address. Um, we have a bit of a situation here where we have one of our participants saying that um, their person goes for um, a walk every day. And now that you have started talking about how wandering can be such an issue, um, any strategies on how they know when that walk can no longer be by themselves? Actually, it's a great question. Um, the first thing you want to do is every once in a while you want to walk with them or have somebody walk with them and make sure that they're able to follow traffic signals, they're not crossing against the light uh, or doing things that are otherwise unsafe. I've had several patients wandering out, or not wandering out, but who t insist on taking walks every day in the middle of the desert and in the spring and, and summer we worry about things like rattlesnakes. Um, and so we have had to have other arrangements made uh, where they might walk at a mall with someone or a high school gym. Um, if the person has a history of falling, you really want to be careful with that. Um, again, having somebody walk with the person is best. I've had several patients where um, they wanted to, uh, everybody's relied on the dog to bring the patient home. And unfortunately, what tends to happen is the dog comes home and the patient doesn't. Um, know what the patient is wearing. Um, know what the pa patient is capable of. Um, do they always recognize all of the streets? Do they ask directions when you're in the car? Um, you know, so that you have a good idea when this person is probably going to get lost. Okay, great. And another um, safety type of question has come in. Uh, we have one of our participants asking, if an emergency happens at home and the person with dementia is the only one able to seek help, how do you recommend keeping important numbers um, in a place that, assure that, that will assure that they'll call 911 if they need to? Okay, first of all, you never want to, never, 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 never want to rely on somebody with dementia to call 911 for you. Um, we've had numerous cases where caregivers have fallen down steps, caregivers have had heart attacks and strokes, and they say call 911 and the patient just doesn't. Um, in fact, I had one case where somebody fell down the steps, had several broken bones, and she was trying to get her husband to call 911, and all he did was look at her and say, uh, is dinner ready yet? And walked off. Um, I strongly recommend for caregivers that they have a lifeline. Not for the patient, but for themselves. So if something happens, it's with you, you can call for help. This is particularly true um, and especially true of anybody who has a history of aggression. And I'm not talking just about physical aggression, but verbal. If you have somebody who's verbally aggressive, um, you don't know when that's going to turn to be physically aggressive. Um, and many of my caregivers will be um, in situations that are quite frankly dangerous. Um, having a lifeline or a life alert is, is one of the few ways you can summon help instantly if you need it. And since we're in this vein of conversation, um, Safety is, is a huge concern as someone progresses into the moderate stage. Are you aware of any other adaptive devices or home modifications that could be beneficial for people who are still in their home? Um, I'm trying to, <laughs> that's, can you narrow it down a little? Um, basically, so, you know, okay. locks on doors are very important. Um, the other thing is checking in with your local fire department. Many fire departments have programs where they have um, 
lockbox is similar to what a realtor would use so that if there was an emergency, the fire department could get in without breaking your door down. Um, you know, making sure doors and windows are locked at night is, is important. Um, very often, if we've got a patient who is uh, touching things and fiddling with them, I've had several house fires from stoves and microwaves, and you, a microwave you might want to unplug it at night. Um, your stove, you pull the knobs off and put the knobs in the drawer overnight. Um, gosh, I, where to start? It's a really broad question. <laughs> yeah. Um, if the person has a tendency to fall, a roll later walker can help. Um, using um, side rails on uh, a, a commode on the toilet can help the person get on and off the toilet safely. Um, bathroom modifications. Actually, let me give you a blanket piece of advice. Um, everybody has some safety issues in their home, like we need to remove the throw rugs and that sort of thing. What you want to do is see in your neighborhood where the, if there's a hospital or a rehab center where there's an occupational therapist, their job is to go through the house and make sure that things are as safe as is humanly possible. Um, if your physician can't uh, recommend that, uh, it's worth it for an out-of-pocket visit to, to get the house so that it is maximally safe. That's a great idea. I hadn't thought of that one before. So transitioning a little bit away from safety now, we have one of our participants who's struggling in the afternoon. Their person is getting more agitated, more antsy and more irritable. Um, any suggestions on how to handle that? Well, the first thing I would do is I would start with the two rest periods a day. And if the patient won't do a rest period, you know, have them sit down and read the paper. Eliminate caffeine for this person. Um, if they're on medication for agitation, you want to give part of the dose um, in the evening before bed because a lot of times it's overtired that you're seeing. In fact, 90% of the time what you're seeing is overtired. Um, and then uh, if you expect the person to know exactly what the behaviors are, so you want to keep a journal, what time they usually occur, and what happened in the last 24 hours that might have triggered it. Now, there are certain six things that will tend to trigger that. Number one is a big change. So if you had visitors, you went to a restaurant, something like that, that was a change of pace, you were traveling, whatever, that's going to be the trigger for it. Uh, the second thing is fatigue, and we're going to you know, give the rest periods um, and make sure the person gets those quiet periods on a regular basis. Uh, number three, not enough activity. So that if the person is bored or tired, they're going to be a little bit owly by the end of the day. Um, adult day programming, this is where your occupational therapist can also help. Or if you have a nursing home in your area with a recreational therapist, very often you can uh, contract with them uh, to have one or two visits to design some activities. Um, I'm a strong believer in adult day programming. Um, the third thing, or the fourth thing, is having too much noise and too many sights and too many sounds. If you go out and you've always gone out to IHOP with your uh, family member and all of a sudden you, they get to IHOP and they look at the menu and say, there's too much food on this menu, I'm going. If the patient tries to leave, they're telling you they can't handle that amount of sights and sounds and stimulus. And your best bet is to leave and let them be. Um, so you want to write down that, get it into a journal. Um, the other thing is illness will cause a problem and misleading stimuli such as television. So you're looking for those things. Um, with the journal, if you know that at 2 o'clock in the afternoon your person is going to get agitated, what you want to do is have, and you go to the doctor and the doctor says, here, take 50 milligrams of X. You want to check with your pharmacist and see if you can give 25 milligrams at bedtime and then um, 25 milligrams at 1 o'clock in the afternoon so that it sort of takes the edge off of the agitation. Okay, a lot of good suggestions in there. 
Um, we have another question. You mentioned this briefly in the program, um, and maybe you could expand on it. You had a suggestion of taking down family pictures. And if you could expand on that idea, um, some of our participants are asking for clarification because that sometimes is a difficult request that we're, we're giving out to families. It is a difficult request um, because it's, in, it, it's easy for me to say as somebody who's a nurse working with people with dementia, oh, we have to do this. But I have to also be aware that there are other people living in the house. But what happens is very often family pictures will trigger that there, there are children in the house, that my grandchildren are here. And I had one lady who called me and she was very upset and she said, my husband thinks he's sleeping with our grandchildren. And I said, why? And she said, well, he, he'll say, isn't this wonderful? We're, we're here with all of our grandchildren. And the grandchildren's pictures were in the bedroom. And I said, you know, isn't that wonderful? You know, isn't that a good thing? And we finally decided that maybe she could, she could live with the grandchildren being in bed with grandpa because he got such a warm, fuzzy feeling from it. Um, but very often family pictures do trigger the idea that there are extra people in the house. And same with figurines, stuffed animals, all kinds of stuff. Um, what you do is, you t let's say you've got somebody who one day is talking about um, children in bed with us and it's upsetting to them. They don't want it. Um, turn the picture over for 24 hours and see what happens. You know, you can always turn it back. Uh, or if you're a spouse and you've determined that, you know, grandpa can't handle the family pictures being in the, the living room or the bedroom, uh, put them in a room that where you might do something else. Just move them. I noticed in, in a couple of your um, answers, you're mentioning 24 hours. Try turning the pictures around for 24 hours. Try turning the TV off for 24 hours. Um, is 24 hours the magic number? Um, to well, see 24 if... hours gives you an, an idea of whether something's going to work or not. Okay. You know, and as a family member, if you see that somebody's agonizing because they think there's a horde of children marching through the living room, um, and you, you, if I said to you, let's turn this TV off forever, um, you're going to tell me that you're not going to do that. And I'm realistic enough to know that I wouldn't do that. But if I said to you, let's try it for 24 hours and see what happens, and the person gets better, then you can make an adult decision about whether to keep doing it or not keep doing it. Right. So another question that has come in, I think this is a common issue that um, caregivers run into. Um, they're saying that their person, um, in relation to a task or a request that they've given them, um, sometimes they do it and other times they don't do it. Can oh, you I'm glad you that. <laughs> okay. When we see patients in this stage of dementia, their biggest losses are planning losses. They know what they want to do. They can tell you what they want to do and how to do it. But when it comes to getting the steps in the right order, they can't get them in the right order to get the job done. The more they think about it, the less they do it. This is why patients want a structured environment and do the same thing the same way every day, because they're on automatic pilot. The minute you take them off of automatic pilot, by traveling, by having guests in the home, um, or having Christmas decorations, the minute anything changes, the person can't manage and it's very upsetting to them. These patients are very aware of this deficit. And so, um, you know, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> um, um, it was someone's doing it, able to do a task oh, okay. one day and not the next day. So th let's say that tomorrow morning you can't put your shoes on. I mean, you would be really panic stricken. You'd know if somebody said, well, you could do it yesterday or think a little harder. That would just make the problem worse. But let's, so we help you, we get you past your shoes. The next day you get up, you're feeling well, you're well rested, the weather's good, everything's fine, and I can put my shoes on. It has nothing to do with you as a caregiver or the fact that the patient wants you doing more work. It's that they're thinking about it or not thinking about it, and they can't sequence. 
I, I think that's an important clarification that you meant uh, you made because I think a lot of times caregivers um, blame themselves when things go wrong or they blame the other person rather than putting the blame on the disease. Yeah, that's very true. Um, so another question that has come in, and this one is relating to activities. I think we have a stressed out caregiver on the on the webinar with us today, and they were just saying that they're completely overwhelmed, and now they're having to schedule activities for their person um, to fill their day. Can you offer any strategies with scheduling activities or any advice to this caregiver who's starting to feel overwhelmed? Yes. Number one. It's important to recognize that you can't do it all alone, that good dementia care is a team sport, and you're going to have to get some help. There's a tendency to say, well, I want to take care of my spouse until we both fall over. Um, the problem is we can't determine who's going to go and when. It's very important that you have a team of people. Most of the time, we strongly suggest people start with adult day programming because it keeps patients busy, active, socializing. And the patient very often won't want to go at first. You never want to say, do you want to, because the answer will always be no. Um, you have to understand that your person with dementia is processing at a greatly re reduced level, developmental level. And so it's like asking a three- or a four-year-old, do you want to go to the playground and they go, no, and you, you're stuck. But what we do is we start the patient in daycare two or three days a week. The first couple of times, the caregiver goes with them just so that the patient doesn't feel abandoned and let the staff take over little by little. And after the third day, patients usually love it. Um, it is not without cost, um, but it's a lot less cost than an assisted living. Uh, the cost is usually about $10 an hour. Uh, very often, transportation is provided. Um, it's a good way to go. Another way to go is have somebody hired uh, like a home health aide. Uh, again, this is an, not just an expense. It's an investment in your sanity um, so that you get a couple of hours off at least once or twice a week. Uh, because at this point, your loved one needs care 24-7, probably. Um, and it's exhausting, and you need time for yourself. Um, you can uh, check with a, a long-term care facility in your area um, to see if there is a recreational therapist or an occupational therapist who can do a consultation with you to uh, design activities, et cetera. Um, it's a good assignment to give to kids, to adult children, too, that, um, yes, they work, but a half a day, once a month, or more frequently, um, to give you a break would be a good thing. But you can't do it alone. The other thing that I would strongly recommend, um, that at least in the area here, um, there are a lot of support groups, and those support groups are absolutely invaluable for caregivers. Good, definitely. Um, getting connected with other people who are going through the same thing um, and understanding that you need help in this, in this caregiving um, journey that you find yourself on. So um, one final question we have time for today. We have a situation where um, the patient is complaining of having a headache all the time. And they've taken them to the doctor. The doctor can't figure out what would be causing them. And so um, any ideas? Is that part of the anxiety? Is that from confusion? Um, any ideas what could be causing that? It's one of those common complaints we see. And we're beginning to look at that. Uh, much more intense, uh, intensely. It's as long as it's been regarded that you know there's nothing medically wrong, like you know a brain tumor or something like that, or migraines. Very often these are stress-related headaches, and it's the way the pa many uh, providers feel it's the way the patient has of expressing their concern and upset at their memory loss that they describe their memory loss and their symptoms as painful. Um, 
a couple of things you can try. The first is the acetaminophen uh, one gram twice a day, and just schedule it. Don't uh, meaning just give it. Don't ask. Are you in pain? Um, the second thing is to believe that the patient has pain. Things like massage therapy can be very helpful. Uh, the other thing is that uh, aromatherapy is another thing that can be very helpful. Um, and time out and rest periods can, can also be very helpful with this. Great, thank you. I think um, it's hard to know when your person is reporting these symptoms um, where exactly it's coming from and um, if they are an accurate report of what is happening within them. So appreciate that clarification. And this has brought us to the end of our session today. I want to thank all of our participants for joining us um, for this afternoon's Dementia Dialogue. And most especially, thank you to um, Dr. Hall for sharing your time and your knowledge with us. As a note, um, the session was recorded and it will be placed on our website within the next 48 hours for you to reference again. Um, as soon as we disconnect the webinar, you will receive an evaluation. Please do take a few minutes to fill that out to let us know what you thought of today's session and if there's anything additional that you would like to learn about. This time of year is when we at Banner Alzheimer's are in our planning season, so we are looking for scheduling all of our 2017 webinars. So let us know what you want to learn about. Please do join us next month as we finish, round out our discussion of moderate stage Alzheimer's disease. And those of you who were concerned about activities, we're going to be talking a lot about that. What strategies can we use? What kind of services are available to help with that? Thank you so much for joining this, us this afternoon on our Dementia Dialogues, where we bring the dementia education to you.